Good morning. I'm Selene Rodriguez from PUC Rio. And um, as always, it's a pleasure to be with you. Despite everything that we are going through, I do believe we were under the grace of nature. It's a beautiful morning. And here, we are here with three major scholars to do what we like most, linguistics. We believe in science. Isn't it a, bla isn't it a blessing? I'm grateful to Abralin for having created this I linguistic event where I stands for instruct, inform, and inspire. I'm also heartily grateful to professors David Kazetsky, Marcel Dendiken, and Norbert Hornstein for having accepted our invitation to compose the present roundtable, the minimalist program achievements and challenges. This table addresses the following question. Are we getting a deeper understanding of language by doing minimalism? To answer it, our current research agenda will be critically accessed, considering the major achievements and challenges of the minimalist program. I chose David, Marcel, and Norbert to conduct this discussion because they are great theoreticians with different point of views about our recent theoretical enterprise. And it's productive to see different point of views being articulated together. Their presentation will last 30 minutes each. And then at the end, we'll have a 30 minute question period. So please send your questions. In order to have a more coherent and articulated discussion, the presentations will be in the following order. Marcel will present first, then Norbert and then David. So let me introduce our guests in this order. Professor Marcel Dendiken is currently a senior researcher in the Research Institute for Linguistics at the Hungarian Acad Acad Academy of Science. Marcel has made many important contributions to our understanding of grammar. I emphasize his work on particles and on relators and linkers. Let me also add that when I started graduate school, I got convinced that there is more to grammar than PF reviews after reading a draft of Intentional Transitive Verbs and Concealed Clauses by Marcel Tendik, Richard Larson, and Peter Ludlow. That's a great paper. Thank you, Marcel, for being with us today. It's difficult to find the right adjective to describe the linguist Norbert Hornstein. After thinking for a while, I conclude that a good one is terrific. He is a terrific thinker. And if you have translated terrific to Portuguese as the evil, it actually still be applicable because Norbert's intelligence is so visible and he's so fast that one, one might have a trembly feeling during a discussion with him. He was, I was very fortunate to have him as my PhD advisor. I learned a lot. He's a senior professor at the University of Maryland and his work on syntax and logical form has clearly advanced our knowledge of language. More recently, he has focused on understanding how central linguistic phenomena, such as binding and islands, can be accounted for if the criterion for simplicity strongly applies to our general theory of grammar. Professor Norbert Hornstein, thank you for accepting our invitation. Professor David, like, David Pazetsky, I'm sorry, is a senior professor at MIT. In Brazil, we say we know a person who only after having eaten a bag of salt with him or her. Well, I have had an academic opportunity to eat at least half of a bag of salt with David. And I got to understand that he's one of the most resilient and tenacious person I know. These good qualities are visible in his work, his contributions on W8 movement, argument structure, and grammatical case exemplify how hardworking he is in organizing and analyzing different sets of cross-linguistic data, extracting robust generalizations from them. This is in accordance with his talent for music which demands focus and persistence. David, we're very pleased to have you with us. Well, let's start the concert. It's with you, Marcel. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to begin by uh, thanking Abrahim and especially uh, Professor Professora Sileni Rodrigues for inviting me to this round table uh, about the Minimalist Program for Syntactic Theory. Um, I am really privileged and honored to be a part of this, although I really don't consider myself to be uh, a specialist in uh, or an authority even on uh, linguistic minimalism, but I hope that uh, the few modest remarks that I will be making about the minimalist program, its incentives, its achievements, its challenges will uh, be meaningful uh, to at least some of you. I hope you can all see the screen uh, that uh, is currently on, on my slide. Is that the case? The, yes. the, it's the title slide? Okay. So we'll, um, uh, we'll start by sketching the circumstances that kicked off the minimalist program and the most significant steps 
taken in early minimalism towards the achievement of the main objectives of the program. And it may be good right at the, at the outset to quote directly from the 95 book to see what Chomsky considered right from the outset to be those objectives. We assume that S0 is constituted of invariant principles with options restricted to functional elements and general properties of the lexicon. Conditions on representations hold only at the interface, perhaps properly understood as modes of interpretation by performance systems. The linguistic expressions are the optimal realizations of the interface conditions where optimality is determined by economy conditions of UG. And with a proper understanding of these economy conditions, we may then uh, move towards the minimalist design, a theory of language that takes a linguistic expression to be nothing other than a formal object that satisfies the interface conditions in the optimal way. All of these objectives spring from a certain degree of dissatisfaction with the state of the art in principles and parameters theory, the model of generative syntax introduced by Chomsky in the PISA lectures at the end of the 1970s. The book Lectures on Government and Binding, which is the written out version of these lectures, revolutionized generative syntactic theorizing by directing the field away from a system of rules and filters on rules and towards a system of universal principles and parameters capturing variation. As Chomsky puts it in his 95 book, the PNP approach is sometimes termed government binding theory, but the terminology is misleading. True, early efforts to synthesize current thinking in these terms happened to concentrate on the theories of government and of binding, but these modules of language stand alongside many others, case theory, theta theory, and so on. The heart of principles and parameters theory is a system of principles, parameters, and modules. It recognizes several uh, sub-theories, including case theory, theta theory, and uh, binding theory, bounding theory, and it inherits from earlier generative grammar the recognition of multiple levels of representation with D structure, S structure and LF being the syntactic levels of representation. And in addition, there is PF, which is extra syntactic, but often used as a convenience by syntacticians as a waste bin for troublemakers. In order to determine whether a particular syntactic construct is grammatical, the theory consults all the relevant modules and determines for each of them whether or not the construct in question violates any of its principles and or parameters. The system gives a star to any construct that violates some principle in any of the modules, multiple violations of the same principle or violations of multiple principles make the penalty more severe. But interestingly, whether a violation in one module could be worse than a violation in another is a question to which the theory never formulated a principled answer, which in fact weakens the case for the modular nature of the theory. In chapter three of the minimalist program, Chomsky for the most part doesn't call the sub theories of the PNP system into question. Instead, he concentrates on the other way in which this system is modular in its recognition of multiple syntactic levels of representation. Chapter three runs through three of the familiar sub theories of the grammar, case theory, theta theory, and binding theory, and asks for each of them, should the conditions on representation that have been postulated for these modules be uh, making reference to any level of representation other than LF, the only syntactic level of representation that interfaces directly with the conceptual intentional system. For case theory, early minimalism unfolds what was uh, at the time a completely new outlook foreshadowed for tense and agreement in the overview article by Chomsky and Lasnik that was reprinted as chapter one of the minimalist program. And the idea is that case is not a feature that is assigned by a head to a noun phrase that doesn't yet have a case feature. Rather, the noun phrase enters the syntax with an unvalued case feature already in place. And it's the task of syntax to give it a value by matching the NP's case feature to that of a case checking head. On the further assumption that this checking relationship can be established only in a spec head configuration, the case bearing NP must move to the specifier position of the case checking head and such movement doesn't happen in overt syntax in all languages. And this tells us that the demands of the case filter can't universally be met at S structure. So this is an argument against S structure, albeit one that is theory internal, based as it is on the hypothesis that case feature checking can happen only via movement of the case dependent element to the case checking head, a hypothesis which has later been abandoned. The discussion of case checking in chapter three also shows that overt movement can't be postponed until the entire D structure representation for the sentence has been constructed. Accusative NPs, when they check their case feature in overt syntax, must move before the T head is merged. If we are to comply with the extension condition, which prohibits the creation of positions inside the structure that had been built up to that point. 
So we also derive an explicit argument against D structure as the sole input to movement. Chapter three's discussion of theta theory is based on the null operator movement analysis of tough movement or the easy to please construction from which Chomsky distills an argument against D structure. Tough movement also militates against the tandem of the theta cr criterion and the projection principle. Their desirable effects are shown to be derivable independently from the idea that movement must have a trigger plus the borea chomsky conjecture that only functional categories have parameterizable feature content that can trigger movement. The argument against DNS structure application of the principles of binding theory, in particular principle A, is built on the sentence, how many pictures of himself does John think that Bill took? This sentence is ambiguous in principle between a reading in which himself takes Bill as its antecedent and one in which it is bound by John. But Chomsky says that the upstairs or John reading is not available if take pictures is interpreted as an idiom equivalent to, to photograph. The impossibility of combining an upstairs reading for himself with an idiomatic interpretation for take pictures only follows if the idiom take pictures must be an LF unit and if principle A of the binding theory can apply only at LF. Thus, uh, these binding facts provide an explicit argument for LF only application of the conditions on representation, at least principle A of binding theory. In the wake of arguing this point, Chomsky proposes to trade in the traditional binding theoretic approach to anaphors for an analysis involving anaphor movement. If successful, this may ultimately allow us to get rid of binding theory altogether, and with it, of one context in which PNP theory made crucial use of government. And the introduction of the copy theory of movement and the movement-based theory to case checking likewise make reference to government redundant in the context of the ECP and case checking. This leads us back to a, the quote from chapter three that we looked at previously. Indeed, if the arguments for rethinking anaphor binding and case checking in terms of movement and for rethinking movement as copying are successful, then government and binding don't actually stand alongside any other modules because they don't exist. Our excitement about this is dampened, however, by the fact that the unificatory effect of the ECP has never been replicated in the copy theory of movement, and by the fact that the advent of the agree-based approach to feature checking effectively marked a return to government and the mist that it has always been shrouded in. One last point I'd like to make about the achievements of the early minimalist program concerns its outlook on phrase structure. The movement approach to case checking relied on the development of Bullock's split infill hypothesis, the accusative NP moved to spec, ag to, uh, spec agro OP and the nominative to spec agro SP via spec of TP. Head movement operations of V to agro O, agro O to T and T to agro S are interlaced with this, and thus we get an account for Hornbeck's generalization. But this der derivation presents a bit of an embarrassment of riches in the upper portion of the tree. And besides, the postulation of agri nodes is a category error. Agreement, after all, is a relationship and not a functional category. In a reversal of chapter three's maximalist approach to inflectional functional structure, chapter four introduces little v, responsible for up to three key tasks, depending a bit on what one's specific assumptions are regarding little v or voice. If little v is to do the work that chapter four holds in store for it, then it needs to allow multiple specifiers although this need may have evaporated again with the recent arrival on the scene of the feature inheritance hypothesis. If real, the need for multiple specifiers in turn prompts the abolition of traditional X-bar theory. Chapter three had taken X-bar theory to be fundamental and not on the chopping block, but chapter four subjects it to the minimalist razor. At first blush, the X-bar XP distinction would appear to be essential for ensuring the right label for the product of phrasal movement to specifier positions. For instance, when an NP raises to spec of IP, how do we ensure that the result is IP and not NP? For traditional X-bar theory, this is perfectly simple. But absent the formal distinction between X-bar and XP, it is not obvious why the result of NP raising to subject can't have the label NP. An answer emerges if we rethink strong features as symbols that the syntactic derivation can't tolerate and must get rid of at their very first available opportunity before the head that bears the strong feature is included in a larger structure that no longer has the bearer's label. The product of merging the moved NP with the projection of I must then have I's label in order to facilitate the checking of I's strong feature, which is the trigger for overt NP movement. Not only is the structure in two simpler than the one in one, by Keynes' anti-symmetry, one actually fails to translate into a linear order. 
But although the anti-symmetry program is evidently minimalist in spirit, for Chomsky, it is not bold enough. We shouldn't be asking whether X-bar structures can be simplified. Rather, we should be asking whether they could be abolished altogether. Chapter four answers this question in the affirmative and gives us the bare phrase structure representation currently on your slide, possibly even without labels being necessary. So there we have it, minimalism in its broadest, in its, in its boldest guise, a continuation of principles and parameters theory, which departs from its immediate predecessor by eradicating many of its basic notions, namely government, binding in the sense of binding theory, different levels of syntactic representation, different sub theories, and X bar structures. Early minimalism was commendably successful in its efforts to wipe the GB slate almost completely clean. What remains is the following features, not as syntactic constructs, but as elements which, when they are merged into a syntactic structure, set the syntactic derivation in motion, merge the basic structure building mechanism, which subsumes move, agree the mechanism used for feature valuation, some notion of locality, and some notion of economy. Most, perhaps all of these ingredients of the minimalist recipe may not be specific to syntax or even to language. The strong minimalist thesis reduces language to merge plus gen general constraints imposed by computational efficiency. Now that we have on the table what I regard as the quintessence of the minimalist program for syntax, let's take a closer look at the challenges posed by each of these five ingredients in turn, starting with features. Perhaps the biggest challenge faced by the minimalist program for syntax is the need to fill the need for a theory of features and their attributes. This need does not seem to be recognized as an urgent challenge by many of the program's practitioners. There's a widespread belief that in order to be a good minimalist, all you need to do is couch your analyses in terms of the checking or valuation of features of functional heads, and that you have the license to postulate features and functional heads at will. There is certainly a basic core of morphological features that we all agree are syntactically relevant, but it is incumbent upon the field to find a proper answer to the general question of which are the features that are involved in syntactic probe goal relations. One specific question to be addressed in this connection is whether it's okay to introduce information structural features into narrow syntax and to have them participate in probe goal relations with designated functional heads in the left periphery. I would say that this is not okay. The features topic and focus are fundamentally different from one's typical inflectional features, such as accusative or third person. Whether a particular syntactic phrase serves as a topic or a focus is a discourse property of the referent of the phrase, not a lexical attribute of an element in the lexical array. Postulating information structural syntactic projections for the sole purpose of delivering the pragmatic felicity of linear strings is a mistake. I'll briefly come back to this in a moment. But even when there is a broad consensus for a particular feature that it is necessary to postulate it in syntactic structures, and even on its locus, there often is confusion about the feature's interpretability. For instance, although many of us consider the feature tense of the head T to be interpretable, there are contexts in which there is no straightforward relationship between the morphological feature tense and semantic interpretation. The phenomenon of sequence of tenses is just one example. If for every morphological feature postulated in our syntactic representations, we carefully examine whether or not it contributes to meaning, we may actually find that none of the morphological features which drive syntactic derivations have any semantic correlates themselves. Instead, it may turn out that whenever there seems to be an interpretive effect associated with the valuation of a particular morphological feature, it is the way in which the syntax unfolds or the representation that it delivers that is responsible for this interpretive effect and not the feature as such. I'm thinking here in particular of the interpretive, uh, uh, the morphosyntactic phenomena dealt with under the rubrics of differential object marking, object shift and scrambling. All of these have semantic and pragmatic effects relating to specificity and topicality. They also have something to do with case and agreement, but it isn't the agreement and case features involved that are responsible for the interpretive effects. Rather, these effects emerge from the syntactic configurations, which are established in the process of valuing these features. Configurations have meaning correlates, so-called constructional meaning. Inflectional features themselves do not. We can build similar arguments in connection with other features in which minimalist syntax has invested a great deal, such as, for instance, the feature plus WH. I won't have the time to delve into this, but my general point should be clear. And if this point 
is in fact correct, we may ultimately conclude that the interpretable slash uninterpretable distinction is pointless. Then there's the question of how checking or valuation proceeds. Do pro go relations exclusively get established on the C command or in the spec head configuration, or should the theory allow for both? There are detailed discussions of these questions in the literature, prominently represented in work by Bjorkman and Zelsta at one end and Polinsky and Preminger at the other. The jury is still out on this, but perhaps we should start nudging the jurors to make some haste to make up their minds. A related question is what the triggers for movement are, if indeed movement needs a trigger. The idea that all movement needs a trigger was a key ingredient of early minimalism, and it had a certain disciplining effect. But in practice, it became a straitjacket, which more often than not has given rise to the ad hoc postulation of features and functional heads to observe the demand for triggers. One prominent syntactician who has mostly turned a blind eye to this demand throughout his work on the minimalism is Richie Kane. The complex syntactic derivations that Kane's anti-symmetry program has given rise to have often been greeted with skepticism, if not outright derision. To be sure, some of the work done under the aegis of anti-symmetry probably deserves this reception independently. But the fact that anti-symmetry often pays little attention to what triggers movement is probably the least of its ills. Indeed, near the end of pop extensions, Chomsky himself comes round to the conclusion that all merge, including internal merge, is free. If you ask me, this setting the clock back to the 1980s is therapeutic, perhaps even cathartic. But it does not, of course, relieve us of the obligation to find a compelling and principled answer to the question of why movement happens when it happens. And actually, movement might very well be quite a bit less ubiquitous than it is usually taken to be. Movement is an instance of merge, so-called internal merge, which exists alongside external merge. And both sides of the merge coin also pose their own challenges. The basic concept of merge is very simple. But beyond this, serious questions remain, mostly but not exclusively concerning the label of the product derived through merge. Chomsky distinguishes between set merge and pair merge, with set merge responsible for building argument structure representation. Perhaps wrongly, uh, Terry Langendon has argued that list merge is actually needed for this purpose and not uh, set merge. And then there's uh, pair merge, which is used for a junction. And there are plenty of questions, both about set merge and about pair merge. And I'm certainly not the optimal person to address these questions, so I will mostly leave those questions aside, although I'll return briefly to the nature of internal merge in just a few minutes. For now, what I would like to uh, specifically concentrate on is the question of whether we really need both pair merge and set merge. In other words, whether there is a genuine need for syntax to structurally differentiate between a junction and specification. There are certainly differences between what have traditionally been called a junction and specification, but I personally remain unconvinced that these differences demand the structural dichotomy in terms of which they have for the most part been couched. In the early days of minimalism, people such as Erik Hoekstra made substantive contributions to this issue, but they seem to have fallen off the radar screen and a revival I think would be welcome. About agree, I can be quite brief because I've already made a few pointed remarks about agree earlier on. For me, the things that stand out as challenges in the context of agree are the directionality of agree and what the locality constraints imposed on agree relations are. And locality provides a natural segue to the next point on the agenda. It quickly became apparent that chapter three's combination of the minimal link condition and the notion of equidistance could not deliver an account of the locality conditions on a bar dependencies. For these, and also for the constraints imposed on agree, the phase was introduced another salient return to the barriers era, but this time around without any principled algorithm for the demarcation of absolute locality domains and with major questions regarding the proper formulation of the phase impenetrability condition and the question of whether the edge of the phase is accessible from the outside. An important challenge posed by the introduction of the phase, similar in fact to the one posed by inherent barriers two decades earlier, is whether the phase is affected by what happens in the course of the syntactic derivation either as a function of movement of its own head or as a function of an agree relationship established with a higher head. Chomsky long resisted the idea that phasehood can be shifted or voided. But in pop extensions, the hypothesis, which is itself not obviously minimalist, that T inherits probing features from C, is explicitly acknowledged to affect 
phasehood. If phasehood is not immutable, there needs to be a principled theory of the conditions under which phasehood shifts, a theory which should at the same time preserve the effects of computational efficiency for which the phase was invented. Computational efficiency is also what has guided the emphasis on economy from the outset of the project. Chapter two of the Minimoist program marks the summit of the barriers era in its development of Pollock's theory of verb placement through yo-yo movement. The chapter is nonetheless naturally at home in the book, The Minimoist Program, not only because it may help explain the awkward illustration on the front cover, but primarily because of the fact that it stresses the role of two notions of economy, economy of representation and derivation. Subsequent research has marked a drift towards derivationalism and has concomitantly concentrated on economy of derivation for which two questions are central. Is merge cheaper than move or the other way around? And is it better to make the smallest number of steps or should the goal instead be to take the smallest steps? If you ask me, the battle concerning merge over move has mostly been fought over the wrong kinds of cases involving so-called expletive constructions and the question of EPP satisfaction. One of the reasons why I'm raising this is that it gives me a chance to mention the EPP as perhaps the most mysterious and alienating ingredient of current minimalist syntax. But to return to the agenda, for the merge over move question as a, a proper answer requires further insight into the workings of internal merge. If internal merge involves copying and the association of one of the copies with the higher syntactic position, as is standardly assumed, then does copying involve an operation which counts for the syntactic economy metric? And is the association of a copy with a higher syntactic position anything other than external merge? If copying is an instance of accessing the lexicon or the numeration, it doesn't come at a syntactic cost because it isn't a syntactic operation. And if copying amounts to the association of a single element with multiple positions, possibly yielding multi-dominant structures, then only EM is involved. If we do want IM to come at a higher cost than EM, then either copying must be a syntactic operation or association with a higher position in the tree is different from EM. And it seems to me that neither is intuitively plausible. The other question that arises in connection with economy concerns the tension between fewer steps and shorter steps. I will not sort through the empirical arguments that have been advanced in favor of densely successive cyclic syntactic derivations here because I've done this elsewhere. Instead, I want to just link the successive cyclicity question to the question about the immutability of phases that I talked about a few minutes ago. If phasehood can be voided as a result of an agree relation between the phase and the higher head, then fell swoop movement and not successive cyclic movement should be the norm. Now that we've made our way through what I think are the five quintessential prongs of the minimalist program for syntax, what remains is the question of whether these are specific to language. The strong minimalist thesis has it that language is merge plus third factor principles, especially concerning computational efficiency. Principles which hold independently of language and in the best case might be considered natural laws. And says Chomsky, to the extent that the strong minimalist thesis can be approached, we have genuine explanations with evolvable innateness, including learnability. With that achieved, we might then even be able to go beyond explanatory adequacy. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's first try to meet the challenges posed for each of the major prongs of the minimalist program for syntax. Frankly, when a syntactician starts to talk about third factor principles and the prospect of going beyond explanatory adequacy, I get queasy and I can't help being reminded of these famous words. When I was younger, so much younger than today, I never needed anybody's help in any way. But now these days are gone. I'm not so self-assured. Now I find I've changed my mind and opened up the doors. Help me if you can. I'm feeling down and I do appreciate you being round. Help me get my feet back on the ground. Won't you please, please help me? And now that I've come to the end of my half hour in the spotlight at this round table, all that remains for me to say is muito obrigado. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Thank you, Marcel, for this beautiful talk and for the Beatles at the end. Now I'm going to pass the, the, the microphone to Norbert Hornstein.
Norbert, you there? Hello? And I'm just trying to get the uh, screening to work. Okay. Hold on. Yeah, let me just move this over a little bit. There we go. Okay. Uh, that was a really great talk. I hope mine uh, can sort of come even close to being as good. Uh, and, but at any rate, let's see what we can do. Uh, what I'd like to do right now is talk a little bit about the minimalist program and the more important question of why it happened and uh, when it did and what kind of accomplishments it's had. I think unlike many in the field, I'm of the opinion that this thing has been a massively successful program. Uh, and I would like to sort of see, try to walk you through what the success consisted in. So before I do that, let me make a couple of comments. Uh, first, uh, the evaluation is going to try to be somewhat uh, um, evaluative in trying to step back and see to what degree the uh, agenda that the minimalist program set for itself has been accomplished. That actually turns out to be hard because I think that what happens is a lot of people have different views of what the minimalist program was a program of. And so I'm going to spend a little bit of time trying to explain what that is. Okay, so let's start. So the minimalist program situated in some history is, in my opinion, the current logical extension of the generative grammar program within linguistics. As a result, it has to be understood in a mentalistic or a biolinguistic way. Uh, this is not unique to the minimalist program. This is just a fact about the generative program in general. So it's mentalistic or biolinguistic component. Simply, it simply inherits from the earlier versions or the earlier phases of the study of language that preceded it. The object of study, therefore, is the structure of the faculty of language, the biologically determined cognitive capacity to acquire a natural language. And the aim of the, of, uh, the program not, a, not any theory within it yet, but of the program is to determine to what degree this, this capacity is linguistically proprietary and to what extent it's co cognitively and computationally generic. So continuing with some history, it's important to understand that the minimalist program follows two extremely successful earlier stages of generative, the generative grammar program with deal with two big facts. The first fact, as we all, as we like to talk about, Chomsky likes to talk about endlessly, which nonetheless does not re, uh, remove the, the observation that it is a deep-seated fact, is the capacity for native speakers to use and understand an infinity of objects that pair a meaning with an articulation. Now, in, the, in response to that big fact, there rises an object of study which is how is it that humans are a, or native speakers are able to understand an infinite number of objects that pair a sound and a meaning. And the answer to that question is that humans have internalized a specific grammar or a finitely specifiable generative procedure is acquired by speakers. And this internalization of, that, of that, uh, those procedures is what explains linguistic productivity. So grammatical uh, specific grammars specif po uh, specify possible linguistic objects of L. And when we propose particular generative procedures for as parts of specific grammars of L's, what we're studying is that internalized capacity. The, the third, the second big fact is what I call, I like to call linguistic promiscuity. Oh, didn't move. Um, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, okay, linguistic promiscuity. 
This is the second big fact, which is that any human is able to acquire any language in roughly the same way. Now, the, this is an important point, or at least I'm going to try to make it an important point. The study of linguistic promiscuity has to await, in order to be interesting and fecund, the arrival of candidate grammars, which we can, whose uh, who be, which become the object of explanation. In other words, we can't ask the question, how do people, how do kids acquire grammars until we have some idea of what the generative capacity, generative uh, uh, procedures and grammars that they acquire look like. Not surprisingly, therefore, you can sort of think of the early days of generative grammar as first trying to give you descriptions of specific grammars and then trying to factor out the features of specific grammars putting some into what we thought of as universal grammar and part of as responding to the language, to the uh, uh, environmental specific features of that grammar in operation. So what we did is going from, in answer to the linguistic promiscuity question, what we did is we tried to develop theories of the faculty of language or universal grammar, which placed restrictions on and recipes for building particular grammars. GB is to be understood as such a theory. Okay, now, given this, whoop, again, sorry, doesn't seem to want to move. Okay, given these two earlier phases, this ones that studied linguistic promiscuity and the one that studied linguistic product, uh, uh, productivity, uh, we, a new question becomes askable. Why does the faculty of language look as it does and not some other way? Or if we believe that GB was successful, which I do, I'll get back to that. Why does it have GB contours? Why does the faculty of language have a GB-ish look? Notice that this is a question in speculative biology. Why did the faculty of language that emerged, that's the joke, in humans look GB-ish? It's important, I think, to appreciate that this is a newish question within the generative grammar program, which is only worth asking once we have some conception of the fine structure of the faculty of language, G being, GB being a specification of that structure. So why did MP arise, the minimalist program arise in the mid 90s? Because till then, the minimalist question is really not worth considering. Now, so the minimalist program, if this is the right way of thinking of things, we can understand the research program as follows. Minimalism takes GB and its findings as given, meaning a roughly accurate description of the faculty of language or universal grammar. And if this is correct, one misconception, I have to say one that I fell into also at the beginning, was that MP is not a competitor to GB so much as it presupposes the GB is roughly descriptively accurate. Uh, Marcel actually made a very good point in his, uh, uh, in his presentation, one that I would like to steal uh, or borrow from, which is that uh, the generalizations, which I will enumerate, some, some of which I'll enumerate for you in a second, that GB uh, uh, outlined, uh, those were retained. What was not retained was the mechanisms and technology that led to those generalizations. At any rate, I'll get to that in a minute. But what we have to do is, uh, if we understand this correctly, if this is the right way of thinking of things, then it turns out the GB generalizations are the targets of explanation for a minimalist theory. What, men, what minimalism adds to the uh, to a generative grammar program is the third fact, which is sometimes called the linguistic leap, which is this relatively sudden, relatively recent, structurally stable emergence of a faculty and language with a GB tinge. That's its new question. And the aim is to account for the linguistic leap, given that we have acquired grammars that display linguistic productivity and the fact that any kid can acquire any language. So now we have the form of an account, okay? Given these three problems, we have a form of an account. What we want is a small, simple addition to the prior cognitive computational apparatus. We want it to be small because it's recent, simple because it can thus be made an adventitious mutation, 
and complexity takes time. And apparently we did not have a lot of time if the current uh, indications are correct, roughly say 100,000 years. And last, simplicity supports stability. It looks like the faculty of language, the capacity to acquire language did not change much over this period, if at all. And what we have now is a hypothesis, the minimalist program hypothesis, which is that small, simple addition when added to a pre-linguistic mind or brain results in a faculty of language with GB contours. Notice once this question gets made, the issue of the distinction of what in the faculty of language is linguistically proprietary, as specific, and what is not is now important. This was actually not an important question in the GB era. We did not actually worry too much about it, which is why we tended to identify universal grammar with the faculty of language. So this is the program. What's, oh, sorry again. It's not moving again, I'm sorry. Hold on, Let's see if I can get it to go. If not, I may have to jump out and just put it on the... Ah, this looks good. Okay. Okay, so sorry about that, technical issues. Main theory, so uh, given this uh, set of problems, we can now ask what are the main theoretical proposals of the minimalist program? Remember the program's just a program, there have been some main theoretical proposals and I'd like to sort of uh, out, uh, mention two. One is the merge hypothesis, and, and please recall this is a hypothesis that merges a very simple, co simple combination operation and it's so novel and linguistically special, it's the sole novel and linguistically special addition to the pre-linguistic mind. And it suffices in conjunction with pre-linguistic mental cognitive computational properties to deliver GB. I wanna to add to this another notion, which I'll call the central dogma of the minimalist program, which is my way of trying to understand the strong minimalist thesis. And that is that all linguistic properties and dependencies are mediated by, by merge. So merge really is the only basic linguistic operation, linguistically specific operation, and all linguistic properties and dependencies are mediated by it. We'll see in a minute what this means. The minimalist project then, if these two things are accepted, is to derive roughly GB from the merge hypothesis and the central dogma. Sorry about this. So Lainey, I'm gonna try to uh get off and come back on again, because it seems not to be uh, responding to what I'm doing here on the, on the uh, uh, notepad, okay? Okay, no problem. So maybe you, you want to unshare and then share. Yeah, I'm again. gonna do that.
Okay, we good? Salini? It does. Yeah, okay, good. We'll go from here. Sorry about this. So the merge hypothesis is a very simple combination operation and the central dogma plus the merge hypothesis gives you a minimalist project. Now, before if we go on and see what the project consists in, I think it's important for us to appreciate just how much we discovered in the generative program in the 40 or 50 years before the mid 90s. Okay, I'm just gonna give you a list of some of the things that we discovered within GB that are plausible design features of the uh, faculty of language. Okay, so what did we find? We found a sample of generalizations. We have linguistic creativity effects, movement effects, reconstruction effects, no lowering structure dependency, binary branching. Here's more head selection, crossover, control versus raising, minimal distance binding effects, cyclicity and subjacency effects, strong and weak island effects, CD effects, and accusativity effects, case effects, more theta criterion effects, NPI licensing effects, clausmate effects, covert A chain effects. ECP, weakest crossover, yep, and still more coordinated structure, psych verb effects, double object construction effects, and so forth. That's a lot of stuff, and that's not all. I could have kept going. So what I want you to appreciate is that we have a bunch of laws. You can think of these effects of laws of grammar, and we have a theory that incorporates many of these, which is GB and an account into the structure of the faculty of language, and we have a program to find a reasonably simple operation that we can use to derive these laws. Or, if more specifically, if the merge hypothesis is correct, we are, our aim is to find a simple combination operation that shows how grammars can generate an unbounded number of hierarchically organized objects with a sound pair, with a meaning, and with dependencies character characterized by the laws GB discovered. That's the goal. Okay, and now I'm gonna to try to show you how it is that large chunks of this goal, not, not all, but a fair number that we should be extremely excited about have been real, realized. So let's assume that merge is a very, very simple, I'm not gonna say simplest, but let's say simple combination operation. Uh, and how simple? Well, here's what it does. It takes two objects and does nothing more than combine them, okay? Combining, I assume, takes a minimum of two. Just combining means that it leaves the combinands, the things that are combined, unchanged in every way except for combining them. Basically, what this does is give you no tampering. It, when you combine basic terminals, they are unchanged. Nothing is added to them. That's inclusiveness. When you combine complexes, at least the complex arguments unchanged, it preserves their previous structure, and that's the extension condition. Okay, more technically what you have is the thing that I gave you up here uh, on this slide. It's an inductive specification and everyone by now knows this. The only part that I want to bring your attention to is the third part where what we're assuming is that merge takes two objects and forms them into a set. There's a lot of, brew there's a lot of heavy breathing about whether or not merge, uh, uh, um, the minimalist program presupposes sets. I think this is somewhat overstated. What it does, what sets are, are convenient ways of notating the fact that all we've done is combined the two objects, alpha and beta. I'm going to return to this in a moment. I'm going to add some labels so this is not quite as simple as this, and I'm not even going to talk about it unless you want to get into it later on. But for the time being, this is enough. Okay, this we all know is going to be sufficient to give you a whole bunch of properties, and I want to walk us through them because it's really interesting to see how it does it. So here are the properties I'm going to zero in on. It gives you unbounded hierarchical recursion, recursion, displacement, natural formats for semantic interpretation, reconstruction effects, movement targets to see commanding positions, no lowering rules, strict cyclicity, uh, structure dependency, and binary branching. Okay, so linguistic creativity. As one, as the rule can apply to its own output, it will generate an unbounded number of different hierarchically organized objects. At this point, I would have shown you how on my iPad, but given that it's acting quite finicky, I'm going to avoid doing that. Uh, but I assume you all know how it is that you can take alpha, betas, and gammas, or words or atoms, and combine them um, uh, indefinitely to create arbitrarily complex binary branching structures. 
So that you can build an unbounded number of hierarchically organized objects seems pretty clear. Movement and displacement. Well, here what you can see is that in this particular structure, right? If you start with something that has gamma, lambda, alpha, alpha, beta, and then what you do is you just merge this thing with this thing, then what you'll get is this thing. Now that looks like a pretty good surrogate or a pretty good representation of a movement dependency. Given that all we did was apply the same rule of recursion that we had here, it looks like you can get both structure building, an unbounded number of hierarchically organized objects and movement from the very same rule of this very same operation, okay? Second, the uh, the two op versions of it, the one that builds structure and the one that makes movement, are plausibly available to represent two of the core features of linguistic representations, predicate argument structure and scope. This is a plausible, and people have argued over many, many, many years, starting from about the early 70s, not only is it a plausible, but this is roughly the way we think of scope dependencies as coded within grammars, this usually thought of as the variable position, this usually thought of as an operator position, but at any rate, the thing together can give us some notion of scope. This dependency between alpha and beta will give us something like the local configuration required for theta role assignment, uh, or at, at, at lambda and this thing will give us the, for external arguments, this for internal arguments. And so the two rules, the two versions of the rule are able to give us the formats that we need for building predicate argument and scope structure. We get, as a result of this story, we get copies, beta over here, and we can treat reconstruction effects, which are interpretations of objects that seem to have been displaced in the original position of their displacement, as in fact piggybacking on the fact that these copies are here. It is not that we have copies that are created, it's not that copies are uh, uh, used, it's that copies arise from the very simplest version of the combination operation. How is it that they arise from the very simplest version? Well, remember, you have to retain the information in the output that you had in the input. So if this is the input and there's a beta in this position, then it has to be there in the output as well, and it is, okay? So in place of traces, what we're gonna have are copies, or more, uh, more uh, correctly, beta will actually be a member of two different sets, and those two, those, the membership in the two different sets is a decent analog for what we mean by uh, movement. And in fact, having the copy in all of the pos positions of the movement gives you the, ba the grammatical basis for analyzing reconstruction. Uh, let's take a look next at C command, cyclicity, and lowering. Well, that's, I can't use. Okay, so what happens is, what happens, uh, uh, it should be pretty clear that C command is, a natural product of this operation. What do I mean by this? Well, let's say we are interested as an E that we move gamma, that we merge gamma with the, with, uh, 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 we have, I'm sorry, alpha, beta, gamma, delta is the input. And what we want to do is we want to merge gamma to something. I merge it to something. The only thing it can I merge to and respect the condition of no tampering is going to be the very top of the tree, or in other words, the whole object. All of these, B and C, are, for example, violate the inclusiveness condition, or I'm sorry, either inclusiveness or the no tampering condition. Why? Well, because alpha beta, which was input to the operation, is no longer a unit in the output in beta, and uh, alpha beta, although the, the I'm sorry, uh, yeah, alpha beta, alpha beta gamma delta is no longer a unit in C. So any movement, the merging of gamma to any position other than the top of the phrase will yield a non-licit application of merge and hence will yield a, uh, and, and hence will not be available to you. Therefore, at least in cases such, simple cases in such of these, the C command condition follows naturally, in fact, inevitably as a condition of the merge operation. Similarly, lowering. You can't lower, you can't have lowering rules for the same reason because you're gonna violate the uh, no tampering condition. 
So the very simplest operation of merge that includes the no tampering condition basically gives you C command and the ban against lowering. It also gives you strict cyclicity. Okay, I leave that as a homework uh, problem. So how about two others? I'm not gonna talk about binary branching because it's obvious. If the simplest operation takes two things and puts them together, then not surprisingly, binary branching will be what you have. Structure dependence, Chomsky has talked about endlessly, and so I won't mention it again here, but to observe that the simplest operation, if it, all it does is combine two expressions, it imposes no linear requirements on those expressions, and thus there's no way to allude to order information when you're worried about uh, grammatical dependencies or rules that, that, are, that, that are dependent on prior operations that you constructed. So to recap, a very simple rule, the merge rule, suffices to code unbounded hierarchical, that suffices to code unbounded hierarchical recursion, also gives you eight other salient features of what looks to be principal uh, properties of the faculty of language. So why does the faculty of language have some of the properties it has? Because it has merge as a fundamental combination operation. Why merge? Because it's a very simple operation and hence the so, uh, possible, uh, uh, possibly arose as a mutation. And these results, the fact that you can get these eight or nine properties from such a simple starting point is a proof of concept, in my opinion, that the minimalist question is not premature. However, it's not also true that it doesn't exhaust all of the properties that we think of as characteristic of the faculty of language as illuminated by GB. So can we go further? Well, that's just a remind, reminder to you of what it is that the basically GB look like. Uh, and uh, I'm going to suggest that no, that's not going to be sufficient. Uh, the, I'm sorry. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna propose something called the uh, uh, extended merge hypothesis. And what this is, is the hypothesis that I mentioned to you the base, that includes the basic dogma, which says that all grammatical dependencies live on merge generated objects. Now, if this is true, we see one huge departure from the principles and parameter theory, which Marcel also highlighted which that there'll be really no grammar internal modules. The modules recall in GB had different primitives, had different dependencies, had different locality conditions, had different ways of establishing relations among expressions that we cared about. If the central dogma, basic dogma is correct, central dogma is correct, that just is not true. Okay, I'm going to have to, in order to illustrate how this might work, make a further assumption, and that in fact go back to the earlier version of merge, which also identified a head of the merged object. In other words, reintroduce the notion of a constituent, which is what merge plus um, labeling was intended to do. So what you see on this line here, I'm just gonna indicate what the head is or what the label is by underlying. Labels are going to be lexical items. We can talk about why that's true later on, not now. And with this in mind, what I'm going to do is I want to sort of see to what degree we can now push forward and explain other properties that we have seen. Okay, so first let's take something called, well, the properties of selection and subcategorization, which we saw, which has something that uh, Jairo Nunes and I described as the periscope property. Uh, here, everyone knows what this is. The head can select and subcategorize a nearby head, but not the spec or complement of its projection. Okay, why not? Well, this follows on the assumption that what we have are labeled ob uh, objects. So let's take a look at the merging of alpha with alpha with this thing labeled gamma. On the assumption that alpha merges with this thing, then it merges directly with the label, uh, an object labeled gamma. Okay, if the basic dogma or the uh, uh, central dogma is correct, it can interact with gamma by virtue of merging with the projection labeled gamma. Importantly, as you see in one, that's what you get. Importantly, it cannot merge with beta and it could not merge with delta. And the reason is, is that this would violate the, the ex uh, um, extension condition or the no tampering condition. 
But if it's true that the only way for two things to interact is by merging, then there is no way for out. So, and if selection and subcategorization is a grammatical dependency, then it too has to be executed under merge, which means that it can't see anything but the head of the thing that it's, the a label of the thing that it's merging with. Hence, the specifier and the complement will not be available, and so the periscope property will follow. Okay, how about uh, 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 construal? Well, the central dogma plus the extended merge hypothesis implies the movement theory of control. Now, I know that some people are more excited by this than others, I being one of the people most excited by it. At any rate, I show you some examples of control using pro as a surrogate of, uh, uh, in the standard theory. Now, we can dis what we, the, in place of control in the GB story, the central dogma and the extended merge hypothesis would argue that you have to first merge John here, you might move it to the spec T of the embedded clause, then mer merge John in another theta position, then merge it up again in spec of T. At any rate, you have a chain that has multiple theta rules. This was considered illicit in earlier theories because we had D structure, but as Marcel pointed out, we no longer have D structure, so this kind of derivation is in principle available unless we try to uh, block it. Let's assume we don't try to block it and see where it goes. In other words, assume that the central dogma and the merge extended merge hypothesis is right. What we will get is a lib obligatory local C commanding antecedent with a pro in a movable position. Okay, this follows simply from the assumption that all dependencies are mediated by merge and that the uh, control has multiple theta roles in roughly a chain-like configuration because those are the only configurations that you can get using internal merge, okay? So where are we gonna expect to see pro? Well, we're gonna expect to see it roughly where we can move. So things like John seems will like Mary, which is a case of movement called raising, we can't do it, and not surprisingly, John expects we'll like Mary, we can't do it either. Why is it, uh, why do we have local C commanding antecedent? Well, we have the C commanding part because it's formed by I merge. Why is it local? Because it's an A chain, which raises the question, are there other kinds of interpretive chains? Okay, so given that all of this thing, we, these things are now things that you get for free. These properties of control come for free once you assume the extended merge hypothesis and the uh, central dogma. There's a nice implication of this, of course, which I can uh, mentioning just so I can pander to the Abraline audience, which is that we'll expect to see cases of uh, control when we have possibility of, um, of uh, movement out of the sp uh, subject of finite clauses. So the sentence you see over here is uh, the uh, Brazilian translation of the bad sentences in English. Well, it looks like we can hyper raise in Brazilian Portuguese. And interestingly, it also seems that we can raise or move out of the finite position of finite clauses in Brazilian Portuguese as well. Okay, how about an Afro? Well, the logic turns out to be the same. John seems as intelligent as no good. So John believes himself or he self as intelligent as also no good. Again, assuming that all this is as a product of movement, the dependency. John seems to be intelligent as good. John believes himself to be intelligent as good. Why? Because you can move from the subject position of a non-finite clause and you should be able to find a anaphoric dependent there. My own view is that the an anaphoric uh, morphology is really just uh, some fix-up operations. I'm following here Lees and Klima from a long, long time ago. But the important thing to realize is that these general properties of principle A also follow as well. It's local, there's a C commanding link, the link between the antecedent and the reflexive is obligatory. Why? Because it's a dependency that's formed in a chain and the lower parts of a chain require the upper parts of the chain. Okay, this brings us next to pronominalization. Reflexes are tails of A chains, bound pronouns I'm gonna suggest are tails of A bar chains. Again, just working out the logic of the extended merge hypothesis. These are not proposals that I think are necessarily correct. I just wanna see where they go. So what you do is you have tails of improper movement chains that look something like the thing you see in the bottom. Everyone said, and then you're moving through the C position, everyone that Bill likes everyone, 
and you get some sort of readjustment rule that turns the lower copy into a pronoun, pronouns being typically tails of chains. Now, if you make this assumption, you can actually derive the complementarity of principles A and B. We have for the longest time stated that they're complementary. This actually goes back to Lees and Klima, the statement that they're in complementary distribution. We can actually now derive the complementary distribution. Why? Because they, are, they live on two different kinds of chains. Each, well, the second one blocking the, uh, the existence of the first. So if a, remember what we had here, the, this is the bottom is an A bar chain or an A A bar composite with something in an A bar position. A reflexive is a chain, but with nothing in an A bar position. So if you can have some, if you have a A chain, there's not going to be any intermediate A bar link. And if you have an A bar chain, you're going to have an intermediate A bar link. These two are incompatible. So when you have one, you can't have the other. So if you assume that A anaphores live on A chains and B anaphores live on A bar chains, you get the complementary distribution of pronominalization and reflexivization. You, of course, also get the C command condition on binding. Why? Well, because it's formed by I merge, again, which is just an application of the extension uh, corollary of the, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, ex uh, central uh, dogma. So assume morphological pronouns mark the tails of bound pronoun chains. You can also derive principal C effects. Why? Well, Moving up is going to be fine. Remember, this marks the source of movement. However, moving down, where the, you'll see a he in this position, will violate, again, the extension condition or the no tampering condition. Note, yeah. too, something quite curious. Whereas A and A bar chains have domains, strong crossover, indeed, all principal C effects do not have domains. Why not? Well, it turns out that the reason they don't have domains on this story is that they violate the no tampering condition. The other ones rely on the special properties of an A and A bar chains, which, whose properties are still left to be discussed and described in a theoretically useful way. So the extended merge hypothesis in the central dogma explains a bunch of features. My conclusion is that this demonstrates that the minimalist program is a very feck and that the merge hypothesis is a lot of explanatory potential. P potential. More projects. Why is there a two-way distinction, A versus A bar? Like uh, uh, Marcel adjuncts, I have no really good story about that. Are there really two kinds of merge set pair, set versus pair merge? If so, then merge is not a unitary operation, unless we can sort of attribute the difference to something like uh, labeling. Larson has some recent work that actually tries to treat these uh, certain adjuncts as certain kinds of complements syntactically. Uh, another proposal was to treat them as specifiers syntactically. That might be work, but I just don't have any good uh, stories about this. Adjunct control and sidewards movement. In my opinion, there's decent evidence sidewards movement exists. How do we prevent too much uh, overgeneration? The work, I would suggest looking at the work of Nunes, Rodriguez, Haddad, Potsdam, and so forth. Uh, let me draw, go back to the very bottom one. Labels, are they effectively bare output conditions the way Chomsky wants to treat them, or are they active in the syntactic derivation? Uh, I believe they are active in the syntactic derivation. So where did they come from and how do they relate to merge? And how do they relate to the central question of is merge the only linguistically proprietary uh, uh, factor? Now, in my opinion, there's many, many more questions of this sort that we can ask, but the important thing is that the merge hypothesis is our first glimpse of what an explanatory theory might look like. And though there are problems and puzzles, and there are always problems and puzzles, I think the minimalist program has proven to itself to be amazingly fertile and massively, massively successful. So onward to greater glory. Thank you very much. Okay, am I sharing my screen successfully? Seleni? Norbert? Anybody? Yes, you are. Okay, good. Thank you. All right, let me just uh, move a few things around on my screen so I know what I'm doing. Okay, so uh, 
I'm a little bit more uh, in the situation of Marcel than perhaps in the situation of Norbert. I'm, I'd like to thank Seleni and our Berlin for organizing this and for inviting me. Um, but uh, I'm not, in, in my own mind, the most obvious choice to talk about achievements and challenges of the minimalist program for reasons that I'm going to try to clarify in this talk. Um, this talk will be somewhat impressionistic and anecdotal, kind of the most anecdotal impressionistic talk perhaps I've ever given. Um, but I think I have some things to say in that category that might be useful in this context. I see myself to some extent uh, as a counterweight to, uh, to Norbert. So my intention here is to be a cheerful uh, and constructive contrarian concerning the minimalist program. Uh, and to suggest that it's a, a good place to be. So I want to begin uh, with some discussion of the government binding theory that Norbert and Marcel have talked about, perhaps more illuminatingly called principles and parameters theory, which I believe was a brilliant and you know, massively important tactical revolution and conceptual revolution in the study of syntax. And my personal view, uh, which bears on Nor Norbert's comments just now, is that the scientific potential of the GB principles of parameters revolution is very far from exhausted and that it actually remains the heartbeat of our living field and the source of most of its intellectual excitement. So as developed around the turn of the century, Chomsky's minimalist program bears a sort of unusual and interesting relation to GB principles of parameters. And I think a useful way to view the actual minimalist program is as a piece of exhortative speculative fiction. And so minimalist program is speculative fiction in the sense that it takes a leap into the future and imagines that at some future date, we have learned that the human conceptual intentional and articulatory perceptual systems with which language interfaces are not crucially species specific perhaps, uh, or crucially linguistic. So that the specific property of human beings that grants to us, but not to other animals, including other primates, a language faculty is the syntactic system that connects uh, these two interfaces, CI and AP. And that whatever aspects of this syntactic system are not themselves sort of spare parts, third factor uh, items are maximally, perhaps astonishingly simple, uh, merge plus as little as possible of other stuff, what Norbert was just talking about. So at some future date, we're there, okay? Um, and it's exhortative uh, uh, in the following sense, uh, that it suggests to us that compatibility with the world of the minimalist program speculative fiction should constrain the set of possible explanations we entertain for linguistic phenomena and guide us in seeking hypotheses that we hope prove correct on independent grounds. You know, so you know, it says your work, uh, you know, your, your, your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to help us build that world, the world of that fiction. But are we ready for the minimalist program? So Norbert and others feel confident that the answer is yes, that GB is correct enough as a medium level description of how syntax works, that we may now treat it in essence as data about which we now construct a higher level theory. My subjective impression is a little bit different. This is highly subjective, that the minimalist program has been harmless and you know, even though exciting, but harmless uh, and may prove productive someday but that the notable advances of the past two decades owe little to the minimalist program, even when nominally flying a minimalist banner. And for understandable reasons, the GB revolution is unfinished and it is still where the action is. And I think for the time being, that's just fine. So here's what I think linguists like us actually do. Um, I include myself. Uh, I think even though he will disagree, I include Norbert. Uh, I include Marcel from what I can tell and probably most of the rest of us. We stumble on a phenomenon, call it P, that makes us want to ask, why do things work this way? Step one, we figure out the nuts and bolts of P. What are the right generalizations? And step hey, two- David. Yes, did you, yes. Did you, did you hear Selene? She says that your, your slides are too small on the screen. Are they really? I have no idea what to do about that. Uh, hold on a sec. Is this better? Is this better? David, give me a minute, please. Uh, let me see what happens here at YouTube. But they are really small. At, uh, at that's, that's bizarre. I've shared slides in exactly this way many times without a problem. 
Yeah, but can you can you use uh, full screen slides? Full screen slides. So better, 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 better. Yes, better. It, okay. So, uh, does this help? Yes. This is better. good. Is, yes. Is it, is it better you. or is it good? Oh, it's much better. Thank you. It's good. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. So what I've been doing so far is mainly reading my slides. So if you've been listening, you haven't missed much. Right. So. We stumble on a phenomenon that makes us want to ask, why do things work this way? We Step one, we figure out what the right generalizations are about the phenomenon P. Step two, we try to figure out more broadly what P is teaching us. What we hope not to have to say about P in the end is that it's sui generis, just describe P, right? Um, and uh, what we do hope to be able to say about P is something like the following. P arises from the novel interaction of one or more factors that are not specific to P. In other words, what we do is we show that what looked puzzling at first is actually boring. We transfer thereby our personal excitement from the phenomenon itself, where it rested at the beginning of our enterprise, to its unification with other phenomena where we hope it is at the end of the enterprise. That's what we've always done to better and better effect as our knowledge expands. It's my belief that this continues to drive the field forward. The minimalist program per se, though it, it's an instantiation of this, uh, has not played a decisive detectable role so far. So let's talk a little bit briefly about, you know, uh, the history of study of syntax, generative syntax from this perspective. So before the GB revolution, and I think it's fair to say that the default mode of explanation uh, for phenomena was the postulation of phenomenon specific or construction specific rules. And so here's a little screenshot of uh, uh, the rules section of Chomsky's syntactic structures. What most research aimed at was the discovery of laws underlying the formal properties of these rules and their interaction. Because whenever a general law uh, governing the form or functioning of rules is discovered, the rules themselves and the rule system as a whole can be simplified. Uh, for example, I'm going to pick an example from actually right before the revolution, the, the very cusp of the revolution, but I could have picked earlier examples. It just would have been more complicated to explain. Chomsky in wonderful paper uh, on WH movement, right, examined a, a range of constructions. You see five of them on the screen. There were others. Right? Uh, WH questions, topicalization, relativization, uh, Mary is easy to praise, tough movement, gapped degree phrases, Ma Mary is too modest to praise. Um, and observe that they have properties in common. Namely, uh, in general, they can apply across clause boundaries. Who did Mary claim I'd praised? Uh, the people who Mary claimed I'd praised and so on. Uh, but not across an island boundary, not who did Mary meet the person who praised or Mary is easy to meet the person who praised. Uh, the second of these properties, movement across a clause boundary, is not shared in the same way by certain other processes like passive or raising to subject or raising to object, which wasn't a, a thing in Chomsky's mind at the time, but could be added to the list. And Chomsky's proposal was that the seemingly distinct constructions that share the properties I've just discussed all instantiate the same rule of WH movement, which today kind of in a worse, with worse terminology, we would call a bar movement. The differences among them derive from the interaction of distinct factors, the types of elements that do and do not select for a WH clause, uh, occasional obligatoriness of making the WH phrase silent, and so forth. Uh, but he factored out a generalization that they had in common. And the ultimate result was replacing a complicated welter of rules in this domain with a single rule that interacts with independent properties of lexical items and independently motivated general principles. This move could have been minimalist program guided, but did not need minimalist program to get underway because independent of worries about third factor and so forth, uh, it's just what we do. Uh, keep doing this to multiple sets of constructions, uh, multiple problems, and the natural outcome which took place is something like the GB revolution. So the GB revolution took as its default mode of explanation, a vast expansion of the explanatory burden on the general constraints. So the idea was uh, what's general about language, what's in UG, are some extremely simple rules, X bar theory for basic structure building, move alpha for movement, move anything anywhere, a referential index assignment, and probably some things I'm forgetting, interacting with general constraints. 
that govern how far you can move, tell you about binding theory. Um, there was a focus at the time on specific conditions on phonologically silent nodes. And once again, probably other things I'm forgetting. Uh, and uh, along with this, there was for the first time a, sort of a way, a coherent way of thinking about what varies across languages uh, that makes some sense from a language acquisition point of view. So the idea was there were two things that could vary parameters within which the functioning of the general constraints themselves may vary, and variation in the repertoire of lexical items or features that influence combinatory possibilities. And we're familiar with Borer's conjecture that uh, uh, Chomsky later adopted, uh, that A doesn't really exist and it's only B, put that aside for now. So we had and have certain expectations if this revolution is to be productive. We expect to find, for example, the reappearance in language after language of comparable phenomena, the same phenomena, the effects of universal rules and the general principles. Predictably, if we're doing our job, masked by independently justifiable uh, distinctness, distinct properties of their syntactic surroundings. And what exactly appears, reappears where and how it reappears tests the details of the theory. And the discovery that this is indeed how the world of syntax works is, in my view, uh, one of the glories, perhaps the glory, of the GB revolution. Examples abound. Uh, for instance, uh, Perlmutter discovered uh, in English a ban on subject extraction from clauses that can, uh, are introduced by a complementizer. Uh, and we can detect this ban in English in all the on WH movement constructions. And so who do you think that met Sue? Uh, is bad, but who do you think Metsu is fine? This contrasts with object extraction where we have no such contrast. You know, and lo and behold, language after language has phenomena that have this general character with twists and you know, uh, minor differences that we hope, and you know, successfully, we, we, we've been successful at this, uh, you know, uh, explain the minor differences. Um, at the time, uh, uh, Perlmutter and then Rietzi building on Perlmutter discovered that there was a large class of languages, however, that did not seem to show this effect. Right? But there, for example, Italian, but there we can find a reason. Uh, namely, in Italian, subject extraction does not contrast with object extraction. Uh, and Rietzi and colleagues argued at length that this is because independently languages like Italian uh, have a way of extracting subjects that permits them to be treated more like objects. Namely, independently subjects can be VP internal rather than externalizing into the TP system as they must do in English. There are complications there, most notably uh, one unsolved complication in Brazilian Portuguese. Uh, I'll put that aside for now. So the excitement summarized uh, uh, could be characterized as follows, that languages are more alike than they seem. They're all variations on the same theme. And for the first time, there was the beginnings of a clear view of the unity and diversity that languages display. This feeds our understanding of language acquisition and brought with it many wonderful surprises and employment for the linguist. Right? Uh, the surprises come from a characteristic of a successful theory like GB that discoveries uh, a construction-free theory like GB that discoveries made in one constructional domain uh, will have implications for others. And the grammars in our heads are not construction grammars, but they're a network of principles and parameters that cross cut the superficial appearances of languages, the superficial constructions that languages have. For instance, minimality discovered in the GB era, though the minimalist and minimalist program was always a kind of pun uh, because it focused attention on minimality, cross cuts destruction, uh, construction types. So uh, movement to subject position, as in A, uh, is blocked by intervening elements of the same general sort, as uh, Ritzi pointed out to us. So Mary was preferred for it to seem to have won, is as close as I can get to an English example that demonstrates this point for A movement, raising or passive. Um, and you find very similar effects. Uh, they're called superiority effects. WH island effects may, may fall together with that in the domain of WH movement, A bar movement, as you see in B. Right? So constructions made, discoveries made in one constructional domain have implications in another. We do not have construction grammars in our head. So now let's turn to the minimalist program. So you know, recall my characterization 
of the minimalist program as a speculative fiction and an exhortation to help build that world. Okay. Yeah, I approve of that. That's a good thing. But we have to ask, um, are signature ideas introduced with the minimalist program actually helping us to build that world? So I'm going to uh, provide a few thoughts and anecdotes. There's no proof here. This is just an impression uh, that suggests that we should be cautious in our enthusiasm uh, about a yes answer to this question. Uh, so uh, I want to highlight first a one domain in which the minimalist program sort of not, you know, sort of accidentally uh, did something good for us, but actually it, it's a retreat from a, a minimalist uh, speculative fiction, uh, a useful retreat, uh, but it's not a, a good, you know, a, a, an exciting example of uh, that's, that world being built. So there was a paradox in GB theory that I, uh, uh, I, I lived through the period when we should have all realized this paradox and I cannot explain uh, to this day, why it wasn't a salient paradox uh, for us. Uh, here's the paradox. Um, one of the major excitements of, of GB work uh, was, as I've already said, the idea that there are no construction specific rules, movement rules, no such thing as WH movement, no passive rule, etc. Just move alpha and independent principles that yield the effects that previously were captured by these independent rules. Uh, there was another point of excitement, great excitement, which was the discovery largely due to Jim Huang's work on Mandarin, but since supported by all sorts of work on all sorts of other languages, um, that uh, whereas something like WH movement uh, is self-evident by the displacement property uh, in languages like English or Brazilian Portuguese, it, it, it happens overtly. Uh, WH movement is also going on in languages where that's less obvious from a visible displacement property like Mandarin or to cite very recent work uh, done by a student in our department, uh, the Gur language Buli spoken in Ghana from which I draw uh, uh, an example. So Huang in this wonderful and famous paper uh, noted that if you play your cards right and you control for this and you control for that, um, we can see that in C2WH elements of a certain sort in Mandarin, uh, nonetheless, Obey Islands have the hallmarks of WH movement in Chomsky's on WH movement paper, right? So getting why in the example on this screen out of a yes, no question, an embedded yes, no question uh, produces a star. Here's a more recent example from uh, Bully showing the same sort of point for what? By Abdul Vasak Salamana, one of my students. So GB excitement number one, there are no construction specific movement rules, no such thing as WH movement. GB excitement number two, the WH movement rule applies overtly in languages like English and covertly in languages like Mandarin. There's a paradox there, right? We're basically saying there's no rule of WH movement and it applies at different points to the derivation in different languages. We should have been saying, huh? But for some reason, I don't remember anybody saying, huh? So there is a minimalist program era proposal that finally covers that. Namely the idea that WH movement is not actually free, but is triggered by agreement of a WH element with a feature on C whose properties may vary across languages in a manner that correlates with overt versus covert movement. Uh, and you know, there are other proposals along these lines um, and uh, it's been a, a big topic ever since. Uh, and that's actually in, a, in advance of a certain sort. We're coming to grips with the problem and it's been really important. Uh, but notice it's a re retreat to construction grammar. It's a step back from the GB revolution. Uh, the aftermath of this is a world of research on the logic of agreement and its complex but and fraught but genuine causal relationship with movement. For example, an entire Friday of talks at a recent conference. It's important work. Right? It's a central topic of Norbert's colleague Omer Preminger, um, providing long missing pieces of the overall puzzle of how human language works. But it's a retreat, not an advance, um, with respect to the bright world heralded by the minimalist program. It's not an argument against the work, we had to do it. But it's still not a sign that the time was or is right necessarily to build that minimalist program future. That was my first anecdote. Uh, here's, here's another, right? it's a slightly different char character. Um, concerning the unity of movement, 
which I think is an, a unique and important and underappreciated uh, Chomskyan conjecture. Punchline here is going to be uh, that it's a really important conjecture and it's minimalist in spirit, but as far as a minimalist program is concerned, it's a challenge deferred rather than met. The issue is the following. Uh, processes like passive raising WH movement, verb fronting, noun incorporation have a key property in common. The surprising presence of a syntactic unit in a non-canonical location corresponding to a gap where we might have expected to find that unit. So a natural thought is maybe all these processes involve movement, except we note that their properties are quite diverse in other ways, right? So they're varyingly sensitive or insensitive to the argument structure of nearby predicates. They correlate or, or fail to correlate with morphology, uh, they're short distance or seemingly long distance. They target nominals alone or they're more widespread. This yields the familiar puzzle, the familiar typology of A movement, A bar movement, head movement. Right? Uh, but there was an exciting conjecture of the GB era uh, uh, rarely stated explicitly that all these processes, despite their differences, do instantiate movement. It's the independent principles that are going to make the distinctions among them. And that's kind of unique to the GB tradition. So LFG, HBSG, and other approaches that I know of give up on the idea that there is a unity behind the filler gap property. Uh, the H H HPSV, for example, posits umpteen different kinds of rules and principles. I, I believe that's the norm to handle these different sorts of processes. Except I, I think that the Chomsky and conjecture is just true. Um, so concerning A and A bar movement, there's lots of evidence of minimality effects that I already discussed, the existence of mixed positions, uh, more recent work by uh, uh, Elise Newman, a student in my department on anti-locality effects that cross cut the A bar distinction, reconstruction phenomena, I can go on and on. Except that head movement phenomena fit badly into the minimalist world as urged on us by the literature if it is a species of movement. It's movement to seemingly a non C commanding position. It's movement of the head rather than what moves in other examples. Uh, it looks like successive cyclic movement in many cases is barred. Ban and X corporation is a name for it. Uh, so there's a the most commonly suggested minimalist program suggestion is it's actually not part of the narrow syntax at all. Uh, the unity of movement is wrong. That hypothesis is wrong. Um, uh, here's Chomsky and derivation by phase suggesting that it's actually a, a kind of phonological process, except that the unity of movement appears to be real and extends to head movement. I, I would love to, to, for all of you to leave this uh, talk and uh, uh, go read uh, what I think is one of the most brilliant papers of the last 20 years in syntax, uh, Jeremy Hartman's 2011 paper uh, in linguistic inquiry, you see the title here, um, where in a nutshell, he presents arguments from a size constraint and ellipsis that A movement, A bar movement and head movement have the property of creating essentially identical operator variable structures following specific proposals for that by Hyman Kratzer in the textbook. The observation concerning head movement being the particularly surprising and exciting novelty of the paper. I obviously don't have time to teach that to you there, um, but it, it's truly a wonderful piece of work. So in this domain, it can be argued that the exhortatory component of the minimalist program, if followed, would have stood in the way of scientific advance. It urged on us a retreat this time without any obvious compensatory advantage. The phonologists haven't taken up a head movement to my, to my, as far as I know. This is not an argument against the minimalist program. The minimalist program is not evil. My points are more nuanced. It's not clear to me that minimalist questions have guided research in directions that it would not have traveled in any way. And some of our most important advances have resulted from putting aside minimalist concerns, if only for the moment. So uh, a, few, a few final remarks. So uh, this is perhaps a, a rare opportunity uh, uh, for me to mention uh, uh, in a current setting, uh, uh, and not for the reason you think, uh, one of the most uh, important uh, opportunities I've had in my life, which was the opportunity to collaborate with our organizer, Seleni Rodriguez, and with Andrew Nevins on this famous or infamous paper of ours. Um, uh, concerning uh, the language Piraha and claims that have been made about it. Uh, in this paper, we found good reasons 
to suspect that properties of the language, such as the absence of possessive recursion, were not causally linked to cultural prohibitions. That was the main topic of the paper. But we also thought, uh, in a paragraph you probably don't remember, uh, that it was important to admonish ourselves and our readers at the same time as follows. Uh, as a practical matter, I'm reading the quote, a linguist investigating grammar in the manner described above generally embarks upon the test with a theoretical framework in mind, a set of beliefs about aspects of grammar that might be considered almost non-negotiable. I'll skip a bit. Uh, as a logical matter, of course, it's possible that beliefs considered non-negotiable will turn out to be false. And it is never good to be so rigid about one's expectations that it becomes impossible for a new discovery to offer the element of surprise. Let me just check the chat, which might tell me how many minutes I have. Uh, very few, okay. Um, so I wanna focus on this word surprise and I guess I have to once again go to full screen. I just jiggle something here. So I think if we pay our attention and do our job as linguists right, we are always being surprised to discover puzzles we never dreamed of. Uh, and our admonition against rigidity is you know, something that I would like to repeat here. Uh, lazily, um, I just went to my appointment calendar to remind myself of the people that I've met with in my own department over the past couple of years and what they've worked on. Uh, and it's all about the element of surprise. Recent work on uh, Koryak by Rafael Abramovitz discovers that ergative or dative marking can be triggered by uh, particular instances of WH movement in the language that he works on. Um, uh, Michelle Yuan, in work she did a few years ago, uh, discovers complement forming movement of a sort that we is highly unexpected under uh, normal minimalist uh, uh, strictures um, uh, in the language Kikuyu. Um, there are recent discoveries by my colleague Norman Richards and by student Abdul Abdul Isaac Sulemana of linear order effects uh, on movement phenomena on uh, anaphora. Uh, I have a student working on the crazy discovery that island boundaries under certain circumstances facilitate anaphora. Uh, I don't have time to, to read all of these slides because I'm really uh, uh, almost out of time, uh, but, but it goes on and on, including, alas, I will not have time to talk about my own recent work uh, that I would love to do to you, so I'll skip over this slide. Okay. Um, wherever we look, we're discovering things that puzzle us. Okay. Uh, furthermore, the task of charting and making sense of the unity and diversity that was a signal promise of the GB revolution also continues to be productive and a continuing theme of research, right? I will just display these slides to you and, and let you skim them quickly, uh, but from your own work, your own students, your own dissertations, I'm sure you yourselves in the audience have a million examples of your own that you can provide. The discovery again and again that, you know, language X is just like you know French, right? With a twist, and then our job is to show that that's really true, and to try to understand the twist. Okay. It's productive and a continuing theme. So my subjective view is that you know this is what we do, uh, and what it teaches us is that the field we actually have is still a field of primary discovery, and I think that's really just fine. They have to ask whether Norbert's idea of, 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 of what's a useful thing to do at this moment uh, ha has actually panned out. Are we truly at a point where we know how things work at an intermediate level of generality sufficiently well so that the time has arrived when we should focus now on higher level explanations? Yeah, maybe yes, but maybe no. And if the answer is no, I think that's just fine as well. And also I could be dead wrong and that's just fine too. But the thing is, I could spend days discussing exciting ideas or discoveries of the past 20 years of syntactic research, and I'm just not sure I can say with confidence that it was the minimalist program that led us to them. Now, mostly this doesn't matter, who cares? But I've been invited to talk specifically about the minimalist program, achievements and challenges. And it could matter a little bit for us, if I can be permitted a, a few cultural comments about the field. Um, I think it's really important as we do our work to distinguish achievements from hopes, because otherwise, how will it, we ever actually be able to turn those hopes into achievements? Right? So, you know, we have a hope perhaps 
that there's no such thing as movement to a Nazi commanding position. You know? But we have to recognize that we don't actually know that yet. Right? Maybe it's true, but we don't know that. So meanwhile, we must not deprive our colleagues of the right to explore surprising ideas on the grounds that such a thing can't possibly be right or cannot be formulated in the current framework. And I think to some extent, the academic culture of, of minimalist program over the past 20 years has invited this. You could see it in reviewing, for example. And I think it's not healthy. But I actually think is the following, that amidst lots of reasons like pandemics for general gloom about the world, the intellectual world of syntax is in great shape. Here I agree with Norbert, with or without the minimalist program. Don't know whether I agree with Norbert and Marcel at this point. We do not have answers to every important question. Not knowing everything, however, not even exactly where we should head next, is the essence of a field that is alive and not dead. And I think that with or without the minimalist program, our field of syntax is gloriously alive. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, David. I must say I enjoyed the duet of Horns and Kazetsky. <laughs> great, great one. We got, we got a lot of questions. I have some comments that I would like to do, especially about interfaces, because uh, the minimalist program puts a lot of emphasis on the interfaces. However, I think very few of us have done really looked at the interfaces. One is Richard Kane, the asymmetry of syntax. The LCA really provides us with a precise way of mapping structure into linear order. But, but I don't see anything like uh, 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 Richard, Kane, Richard Kane's work on other interfaces. So we haven't yet really analyzed how the interfaces really work, right? We, we don't have, really don't know yet how they are, in fact. <coughs> We don't know how the, what are the interlocks among the, the, the components of the grammar. And I would like to hear more about it from you, from the three of you. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Do you agree, Marcel? I, I will second that, yes. There is interesting work, definitely, that has been for quite some time uh, in the realm of prosody, uh, studying the way in which syntactic structures and prosodic structures are related to one another, uh, whether there is a direct match between prosodic structures and syntactic structures. Probably not, but then trying to understand where there aren't any exact matches and what the causes of those absences of exact matches are. I think that's intelligent work. That's very intelligent work by Lisa Selkirk, by Michael Wagner, by Arsalanka and Muyipur. Uh, all of that work is, is, is very intelligent, also deeply uh, enmeshed with theoretical developments in a minimalist program. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the interpretive side, on the semantic slash pragmatic side, um, there is uh, there's less perhaps satisfying work uh, then there might have been uh, if one had taken more seriously the idea that rather than features such as topic and focus driving syntactic derivations, what you rather see is that syntactic derivations produce the kinds of representations that they produce and those representations then have particular interpretive effects. There is there's unfortunately less of an emphasis on that kind of work than I think there should be and more of an emphasis on cartography. Don't get me wrong, cartography isn't uh, isn't evil. David used that uh, that that, uh, that that characterization also e uh, earlier to say minimalism isn't evil. Cartography also isn't evil. Just like OT isn't evil, there are all sorts of things that aren't evil, but there are perhaps reasons why we might want to uh, not think of uh, cartographic approaches as explanatory and to try and look for possible explanations more uh, uh, in the interfaces. I would just like to add one more thing, which is that I think that there is, has been the beginnings of some extremely interesting work on uh, interface properties. And when you take a look at them, you start finding out how difficult it is to sort of set the problem uh, of what it is that's being interacted with the interface. So I'm thinking of recent work by uh, uh, Petrosky and Lids and his colleagues on quantifiers, uh, things like most, 
things like uh, the conservativity properties of quantifiers. There's some interesting work by Fox that was done on this that actually piggybacks on the copy theory to try to explain why determiners in uh, natural language are conservative. Uh, there's another uh, attack on this problem by Paul Petrosky, which actually takes a look at uh, trying to restrict the, uh, how should I say, the descriptive power of your semantic theory uh, to explain why it is that conservativity holds and why restrictive quantification is necessary. When you take a look at this work, which involves trying to match uh, descriptions like most of the dots are yellow to displays, it, you find out just how difficult it is to understand what it is that uh, interface, how, well, how the interface works so that we can have a question that's sufficiently specific to understand what kind of answer we're looking for. So I think it's very, very hard, but I think there's some glimpses of it that are not bad. Thank you. I have another question, another comment, which involves optionality. So if, if movement is triggered by features, how do we deal with optionality? For example, uh, David Pesetsk cited uh, WH movement. But that, there are languages like Brazilian Portuguese in which WH movement is optional. How do we deal with that? Well, first of all, I think Brazilian Portuguese is not Mandarin Chinese, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. It's a language in which in main clauses, the WH can move or not move. Um, but in subordinate clauses, it's, it's, it's more like English. Am I wrong to think that? So it's not, it's not a language where you say, uh, Mary wondered, uh, Sue bought what? I think you can, for example, you can say like, a Maria disse, a Maria disse que o João comprou o quê? Mary said that John bought what? No, but, but, but how about Mary wondered a Maria se what, where, where we have an embedded question, not a main class question. A Maria se pergunta o que, que o João comprou. Okay, W8 movement perfect. A Maria se pergunta o João comprou o quê? I'm not sure that it's really bad. I don't know. I mean... Okay. Okay, so, so putting, putting that aside, I mean, there, there's, you know, there's mm -hmm. substantial work on uh, the ways in which the semantic interpretation of WH phrases in C2 uh, takes place, you know, um, that is in conjunction with developments of, of the work that Seth Cable did, arguing that there are more elements involved in WH constructions than you can see uh, in some languages. So there's a Q morpheme that, that, that's uh, distinct from the, the actual WH word, um, you know, which opens new possibilities for understanding apparent optionality, right? So, you know, where the Q morpheme uh, is positioned, whether it projects or doesn't project can all figure into the question of whether in the end we see over it or, or uh, over WH movement or not. So I, 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 my, my, my personal suspicion is that the question of optionality is a mixed bag in exactly that, that sort of fashion, that we're going to learn that sometimes it's a matter of lexical choice, sometimes it's a matter of different semantic options, sometimes it's a matter of where null material is or is not merged. And then other people answer. And let, me, let me join the discussion here by uh, echoing the comment that David started with, namely that in the Romance languages, which have so-called optional WH fronting, it is typically not the case that the optionality manifests itself in subordinate context. And when it manifests itself in the root, uh, I don't think it's been studied quite in the right kind of way. So the, w the paper on WH movement by Chomsky, of course, stressed the fact that all sorts of phenomena that aren't exactly the same are nonetheless united by, as we now say, all being a bar movements. And what we now experience as WH movement is sometimes indeed technically WH movement, movement to spec of a plus WH CP, um, or it is focus fronting. Now in, in subordinate context, it turns out that you must actually move the WH into that position, which is presumably the spec of the plus WH uh, CP. That's probably for formal reasons. There is a way of, uh, of making that understandable, which Jacob Boschkovic and I have both uh, given very similar explanations for. In the root, it may very well be that what you experience as WH movement is in fact never 
uh, movement to the specifier position of that plus WHCP, but instead focus fronting, which we know is optional, but not semantically innocuously optional. So an in situ focus and an ex situ focus tend very, uh, very often, and you see this particularly clear in languages like Hungarian, to be interpretively different. An in situ focus uh, is appropriate for in a WH context, and I mentioned some. Uh, kind of contexts are not exhaustive, whereas an ex situ WH focus would then be uh, exhaustive. And so it's very much worth the researchers while to ask whether the so-called optionality that you find in WH fronting and root contexts in, for example, Brazilian Portuguese or in French uh, is in any way associated with the semantic or interpretive effects. Let me make it uh, looser than semantic, the interpretive effects that we know are associated with in situ and ex situ focalization. That I think will be very much worth our while. And I, I haven't seen this yet, but that probably is because I haven't been looking and I'm not really uh, following that literature carefully. But I would think that that is a very fruitful way uh, to pursue your question. I think that there's a third, there's, a, there's something else that I think I, at least I would add, which is I think it's worth thinking what it is about optionality that's considered difficult. Uh, so uh, one thing that was worth that uh, I think that uh, Marcel put his finger on correctly, there is no difficulty making all optional movement ob uh, obligatory. In one case, you don't have the feature. In the other case, you do have the feature. Optionality per se is not the difficulty. It's easy enough to sort of code it. The question isn't whether or not it's codable. The question is whether or not it's worth coding, right? And uh, that, I think, is an entirely different question. So optionality, per se, I don't think is a theoretical or conceptual problem. The, the, real, the, the other question is, and this is actually an old GB question, if there is optionality, the problem is trying to figure out when it is that you use it, right? So in other words, there's nothing wrong with an optional rule. And now the question is, is learning the fact that a rule is optional a particularly difficult thing to learn from the basis of the primary linguistic data? It's entirely conceivable that the answer to that question is no. But you know, we tend not to worry about that question because being linguists, we don't think much about the language acquisition problem. Uh, so I think that the, the question itself may not be particularly well posed. It may not be a problem. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. And uh, let me give you some questions we got from YouTube. First one is Dan from Daniel Carvalho. And his question is, what is the role and the challenges imposed by the lexicon to the minimalist program? The role that the lexicon poses? Yes, the role and the challenges imposed by the lexicon to the minimalist program. Well, one thing, if David is right, that, that uh, we assume that parameters were basically thought of in the Borer fashion, then depending on what the lexicon is, will be a strong determinant on what your theory of locality is going to be, for example. You know, all, all variation is going to be variation in the lexicon. Uh, if that's correct, and I think it's plausibly correct, uh, if it's correct, then understanding how the lexicon does this is going to be a big deal. I don't think we have that good of a handle on how it is, what the options for lexical items are, which allows us to account for variation. What I mean by that is we have no problem presenting an optional lexical item when we need it in order to account for variation. But when and what the inventory is, is, I think, completely unclear at this moment. The other big place is, and again, this is not really my area of expertise, I think Marcel and David might talk about it more, is really the role of roots you know, and categorization in the syntax. Uh, for a long time, we thought of that as a problem in the lexicon. Now, I, my understanding is it's a problem in the phrase structure with category defining heads and that will also sort of have an impact on how we think of the lexicon, I would think. There's something one might add to this. I, I, I hesitate because I, I, I know almost nothing about the topic um, that relates the lexicon to the minimalist discussion that we're having, um, which is you know, there is this idea that what makes, that I, I think we all alluded to in different ways, that what makes humans unique and possessing language faculty uh, could be limited to merge, could be limited to, or close to limited to merge. Um, uh, 
there's a, there is a fact out there that I think is true, right? Which is that uh, human beings in the course of language acquisition have this sort of astonishing vocabulary growth spurt. You know, they're learning, I don't, I don't know the numbers, but you know, umpteen new lexical items a day, you know, something, something astonishing uh, in late infancy. Uh, and to the best of my knowledge, that too is uh, unmatched uh, elsewhere in the animal kingdom, right? You, you spend, you know, you know, months and months and you can get, you know, Washoe or some, you know, some other primate, you know, to, to, to behave as if they had some lexical items. Now that too could be derived from merge conceivably if, if lexical learning depends on understanding syntax, right? Or if words themselves, as some people urge, are, are built up syntactically. But that strikes me as a, another point of connection, perhaps a deep one, between problems of the lexicon and the minimalist conjecture. One thing that I mentioned in my presentation is that the minimalist program doesn't have uh, currently a theory of uh, features and the um, admissibility of, of the things we call features in driving syntactic derivations. That relates also to this question. So syntax is being spoon fed and then works with uh, material coming from the lexicon, particularly features that are then thought to be driving forces for uh, syntactic operations. And so an important question that we need to ask is what the kinds of features are that can be spoon fed to, uh, to, to syntax. Um, I, in fact, mentioned the, uh, in my view, unlikelihood of features such as topic and focus being in that set. But uh, it's, it's fairly clear that we, there is a general agreement that features such as case and phi and tense are in that set, plus WH probably too. Um, what exactly is the set? Are we, uh, are we, can we make new features up at will, or is there a certain, um, is there, is there some prior knowledge that that is available somewhere uh, in, in in other fields of linguistics that we can draw on? Is there a theory uh, that we can construct about what are the admissible features that syntax can manipulate? I think these kinds of questions are important to uh, to address, and by addressing these, we are also directly addressing the question of what the lexicon is like. Uh, and, uh, and therefore how the lexicon and the syntax interface. Let me just add a note of skepticism in this. It's the, the syntax has made real progress when we've discussed the problem of structural universals. We've actually discovered a huge bunch of structural universals. We've actually had much less success in discussing substantive universals, going all the way back to when the distinction was first made. Uh, even the NVAP distinction is not at all clear anymore. So I think that the it's not merely that the minimalist program has had no idea of what's going on. GB has had very little idea of what was going on in the lexicon. Uh, the standard theory had very little idea of what was going on in the lexicon and the stand and the and syntactic structures had very little idea of what was going on in the lexicon. So this is a long, long standing problem. Uh, and uh, I don't think that anything that we've done, uh, certainly in the last 20 years within minimalism has done very much to illuminate it. Let me just uh, raise the bugbear of all possible features, the EPP feature. That's the one that drives me crazy. Uh, but if there's an EPP feature, then anything is a feature. OK, that was great. Uh, I have now a question for Marcel from Lilian Souza. Marcel, in some languages, topic and focus have morphological implication. Is it possible to include these cross-linguistic differences in a similar generalization? The morphological reflexes that topic and focus have um, are certainly not um, incompatible with an, with an approach to topic movement and focus movement that says they're not driven uh, by uh, features that uh, are called topic or focus. So what we should think of as the morphological reflexes of topicalization and focalization. Um, what we should think of those is perhaps something similar to what we know is going on or what we think is going on with differential object marking, uh, where we see that a particular object or a particular noun phrase has a particular morphological marking, depending on whether it is specific or it is not specific, whether it is topical or not topical. That is then in the differential object marking language is typically done via dependent marking. So the, the object itself has a particular thingamy attached to it that tells you, okay, it's accusative or it is whatever it is. And 
con concomitantly, apparently, it is an, it's a topic uh, or it's specific. For head marking, uh, the, the story is the same. There is something in a functional head that um, that that uh, has a relationship with an interpretation of a certain sort of a particular object. It isn't itself the uh, driving force for topicalization, but it is the driving force for syntactic operation that is driven by a particular morphological property that that functional head might have. That is a, a morphological property, and it is a, it's reflected as such also in the PF signal, and there is an interpretive correlate to this. So I would actually um, caution people to not interpret certain morphological signals that are uh, interpretively associated with topicality or with focality as markers of topicality or markers of focality. They're markers of something. They could be case markers. They could be agreement markers. They could be whatever, but they are not themselves topic markers or focus markers. All the in very interesting work that was done uh, in, 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 in early cartographic work by uh, Enoch Abo on, on Gungbe is marvelous work, absolutely marvelous work. But to say that the thingamies that you see in Gungbe are focus heads or topic heads and are responsible for driving topic movement and focus movement, I think is a mistake. Perfect, thank you. I have now a question to Norbert, then a question to David. And I think we should finish because it's time to. So a uh, question to Norbert from Josep Baraskin. Norbert, isn't the very existence of long distance reflexives module the postulation of a lexical idiocracy, a counterexample to the theory which reduces reflexives to res residual movement? Uh, no, it is a counterexample to treating it, to calling it a reflexive, perhaps. I mean, reflexive, it's a bound anaphore. Uh, and the question is whether or not one can find evidence that the bound anaphore is related to its antecedent via movement. There's a rather respectable line of research in the uh, literature in, uh, on Japanese long distance anaphores, which in fact does treat uh, these as products of movement. Uh, we call them sometimes improper movements, right? And there's a question of, you know, what the status of improper movement is. But there's actually not bad evidence to suggest that something like that is on the right track. Uh, okay, let me uh, give you two of them. It turns out, for example, that when you have a pair of long distance anaphores, uh, and they have, uh, say, a, three, a, a sentence with three levels of embedding, uh, two anaphores in the embedded clause, uh, two subjects in the matrix and in the first embedded clause, it turns out that we know that the anaphores have to all relate to one antecedent rather than to two. Okay, so you can't split the anaphoric dependency from the third clause to the other two subjects. Well, this is actually reducible to a WH island effect if you happen to think that the thing is derived by movement. Here's another one. Uh, it turns out that uh, some interesting work that was made a while ago, if you take something like merge over move, you might actually be, a, and plus phase theory, you may be able to derive the subject orientation of long distance anaphores. Uh, 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 Motomura, who was at uh, Maryland about uh, 35, 40 years ago, maybe it's 25 years ago, uh, actually did some very interesting work suggesting that the subject orientation effect could be a merge over move effect. And in fact, that what you're seeing is that, uh, and this constitutes indirect evidence that the long distance anaphore is the product of movement. What is true is that the morphological reflex of reflexivization and long distance anaphora in these languages is the same. I don't know if that's particularly interesting. There's a lot of languages where there's uh, the same reflex of uh, bound phenomenal anaphora and bound anaphora. It just means the morphology has not caught up with the syntax in that regard. That I take to be a not particularly significant fact, maybe echoing words that I think Marcel was making about how the caution that one should have in interpreting morphology as direct, ref, uh, direct uh, uh, reflex of uh, some deep-seated grammatical dependency. Thank you. Oops, hold on. Let me go back here. I have now a question, question for David from Patrick Elliott. It's actually a question for everybody that 
he asked during David's talk. The consequence of pol uh, positing weird operations from the minimalist perspective, such as under merge, are completely unclear. Should we be worried about it? That's the end of the question. <laughs> Read it again. Hold on. I mean, we should worry about everything we say, right? I mean, you know, so so you know, every every, every you know everything we propose has a why question attached to it. Right? Um, under merge is weird um, from certain perspectives, right? So, for example, you know, if you have a certain view of what the you know purest simplest theory of merge per se uh, would be. You know, you, you, you want to derive a no tampering condition and under merge tampers, right? Um, the, 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 one of the problems with, you know, the minimalist dream, though, is that it, you know, it, well, I'm going to mix my metaphors, having just called it a dream. It's a, it's a multi-edged sword, right? So, you know, it's often possible to think of, about multiple dimensions of simplicity, uh, uh, that can lead you in, in, in one direction or another. So um, in uh, a monograph of, of my own on, on Russian morphology, where I think I introduced the term undermerge and actually came up earlier and worked at Esther Torego and I did together, but, but, but didn't publish, um, you know, I pointed out that one way of viewing undermerge uh, that it, uh, is, say, in Michel Yuan's sense, uh, is that it is whatever motivates merge uh, in subcategorization except the internal merge version of that, right? So you could imagine, you know, you know, a theory needs somewhere, uh, someplace that has the traditional consequence that subcategorization had in earlier theories. So we know that, you know, devour requires an object in English and eat does not. Um, so we're used to thinking about that as a deep structure requirement, that is to say, uh, as a requirement satisfied by external merge, if it's satisfied by external merge and branching is only binary, a head can have only one such requirement. But if you hold constant uh, branching being binary, that's, a, that's another question of simplicity there we could take up. Um, but uh, you, you view internal and external merge as just two flavors of the same operation. You could imagine a head uh, having multiple subcategorization properties with the consequence that only one of them could be satisfied by external merge, the others would have to be satisfied by internal merge. Suddenly you have the, op the weird operation looking not so weird from a certain perspective, right? Um, again, that's kind of what we do all the time, but you know, when we're looking for simplicity or compliance with, with minimalist ideas, there's often multiple dimensions that one can examine a problem from. Uh, so taking a Patrick's example, you know, this could be a possible response. So best I could do. Okay. Anything else? Yeah, I, I'd like to add one thing. I, I think that Patrick makes a good point, and I think David makes a reasonable response, but I would like to push a little bit on that response. Uh, and that is, it's always going to be true if we have non-trivial theories that we're going to have constraints on what it is, prima facie constraints on what it is that we can do. In fact, if we didn't have prima facie constraints on what we thought of as reasonable hypotheses and alternatives, we wouldn't have much of a theory, right? But we all agree, I think all three of us, that that's a good thing to have a theory. So now the question is, has, is the pushback dispositive. In other words, we see an example of something that looks like it's working and it goes against the grain of what we believe to be a reasonable hypothesis. And so we throw it out. So far as I know, no one has ever suggested throwing out. What they have suggested is recognizing that constraints of a theoretical nature have bite and that we should respect these. And the reason we should respect them is because they guide the way in which we think of a problem. So let's think about undermerge, right? Well, okay, question. What does it buy us empirically if we assume it? Question, what does it cost us theoretically if we assume it? Re resolution, might we have our cake and eat it too in this case? If not, which part of the cake do you not want to eat? Now, this of course is all perfectly reasonable and this is exactly what we do, but we can't do it, I think, unless we take our theories very, very, very seriously. The thing that's really interesting, in my opinion, about the minimalist hypothesis 
has been it has generated conjectures, conjectures about what are reasonable approaches to problems, such as should we use undermerge? And if your answer is no, then here's a problem for you. Figure out how to get the data that people who use undermerge get in some way that respects the general guidelines of your theory. That I think is extremely helpful. In fact, I think a little bit, I have to say a little bit of the live and let live, I think is a little bit unhealthy. You know, everyone should do whatever it is they want. Yeah, of course, no one's going to legislate what kind of research you can do. But I think that simply means that we demean the theoretical apparatus and don't use it in ways that could be extremely fruitful going forward. So if I can take a second to, to reply, you know, um, I agree with, with the spirit and, and almost all of the letter of what Norbert just said. I, I, I think perhaps the point that I made a few moments ago uh, is a point that I could have stressed in the talk itself because I think it's, it's relevant here. Um, that is to say that you know, we should take our theories very seriously. Um, but uh, I think it's also healthy to have multiple goals, maybe conflicting goals or maybe temporarily conflicting goals in mind simultaneously because there are multiple dimensions of simplicity. There are multiple dimensions of you know, things we might like to hear or things we might like to discover someday. And a priori, both as a factual matter and as a tactical matter, we can't predict you know, which of these desirable paths we should prioritize at any given time. Right? You know, and in a way, we're fine. This is what we always do when we come up with a weird proposal like you know, Undermerge, let's say. Um, we do what I just did. We try to construct a just-so story that makes it sound not so weird. And if you analyze what we're doing when we're doing it, we're saying, OK, you have this dream of what, you know, what strictures we should impose on ourselves to achieve a particular goal, to answer a particular question. Here's another set of strictures that are also attractive from some higher level uh, perspective, uh, such that if we pay attention to them, we prioritize them, uh, we might be justified in pursuing this idea. You know, live and let live is, is never a, a, a good policy and maximal open-mindedness gets us nowhere. Um, but having multiple goals perhaps increases our chance that we'll discover what we need to discover and achieve some of them. I'm done. <laughs> okay, unfortunately we have to stop here. It's really, I really enjoyed being with you and it was great. And thank you, thank you all for- Thank you so much, Tony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So that's it folks, thank you. Bye-bye. Right.